me. I'm Ron Funches, and we're all working on getting better. Hi, guys. It's me, Ron Funches. You're watching and listening to Getting Better with Ron Funches. And we're on our fourth episode. Yeah. Wow. We've made it this far already. That's like a whole month of episodes. That's amazing to me. It's good to be here. Um, I've been out and about, been busy. I went out to a wrestling show that I was very excited about. I was part of a convention called StarCast, which was in relation to a wrestling show called All In, which I went to, which was very inspiring to me. Um, I'm not going to take too much time talking about it. I know this isn't a wrestling show. We got a guest and we got a lot of things to get into today. Uh, but for those who, I'll try to explain it for those who don't know much about wrestling is that, okay, so I'm sure you know what the WWE or the WWF is and Vince McMahon. And Vince McMahon is like the leader. He's like Darth Vader. Like he is like, he keeps law and order. He's in control of everything. Everything kind of runs well under him, but also, you know, it's, it's probably inherently evil, and, and he doesn't seem like he is probably the greatest of people. He's a great person. He's done a lot of great things, that's for sure. I would never take anything away from him, and I don't like to judge people for their political beliefs or whatever they're about, but also, these guys, is a like a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar company, and their performance don't have health care, so you know that seems like an issue to me and also there's a whole network where then, then they don't get residuals which you know I, I mean i would never me as a person who works in entertainment business who is a in under sag which is a, our union um, i would never work for a thing where i don't get residuals that makes no sense to me uh but you know sometimes again we've talked about this before people try to take advantage of your dreams you know and sometimes these people's dreams were to get into the WWE and then for you get there and then you kind of find out that it's not under your control uh, how how far you go and, and how much money you make. Um, it's under whether someone likes you or, or if you're cool with the boys or whatever. And so there's this group of wrestlers. Uh, Cody, Cody Rhodes, and then the Young Bucks, and those, so they're like the Rebel Alliance. Um, and then they, their whole thing was that they were going to make their own show and try to sell out a ten thousand seat arena. And everybody was like, not everybody, but some old haters were like, you can't do that. You're not Vince McMahon. You're not Darth Vader. You can't do that. That's the only he could do that. You guys couldn't do it. The actual wrestlers couldn't do that. And that's what they did it. And it was a great show. It was excellent. As a freelance artist, it was very inspiring to me to see people just so connected to their fan base and and, and the fan base take care, in turn, take care of them. And, and there being no middleman, no studio, no network in between them. Um, as a person that does what I do, that's very inspiring to me. Um, and so I, I just really want to tip my hat to, to Cody Rhodes and, and Nick and Matt Jackson and um, Conrad Thompson. Uh, thanks for having me there. I was able to do a roast of, of some of my favorite wrestlers and work some of my f favorite comedians. And it was really fun. And I think that's um, a big part of what I'm trying to do in my life more lately is make money and have have, um, have my work be the same as my life and my fun and that was one of the best examples that has ever happened in my life where I could just talk with wrestlers hang out with friends I mean I was there with Mike Lawrence Dan St. Germain and and uh, Taylor Williamson and, and Shuley and, and other comedians that, that I've known for years who I knew also loved wrestling and here we were just making money and having fun doing the things that we love and i was like this is i mean it was all you want in life right that's that's all you really want in in life and then i had a wonderful weekend out with, with my girlfriend as we refer to robot because uh, she's a private person and she doesn't want you to know her full name at this time um, also, I'm trying to talk a little bit slower and more of my natural tones. Uh, that was a note that I had received. So if you notice me doing it, I just get a little antsy. I want to be good, guys. You know, that's me and my life in general. I just want to be good. I don't like to do anything I'm not passionate about, uh, which is something we fall into this week that I got to talk about. We'll talk about um, a little bit later, but we're doing a little week wrap up of, of what I was doing since the last spoke to you guys. Um, I saw Robot. It was her birthday. Uh, so we went and walked around Stanley Park and had a great time and ate ice cream. And it was really fun. She's a fun person. Uh, she also 
tends to tell me when she doesn't like a, what I'm doing when I'm doing something and I don't like that uh, but you know she's usually right or correct um, but also I don't like that um, <laughs> uh, but other than that you know things are great she's wonderful she's kind as she is beautiful so that is good um, and it was lovely that she wanted to that all she wanted to do was her birthday was walk around the park with me and eat fruit uh, that I got for her while I was angry because she had made me mad. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and that's what relationships are, you know, still being willing to go get them fruit uh, while you are currently not happy with them. Uh, that's just any relationship in general, you know. <laughs> um, and then other than that, we'll get back into the uh, real life things of it. Um, I went around and I told you guys that I was pitching a show um, that was basically about my life as my childhood that was going from from Chicago to Oregon and my time period there, going from living with my mom to living strictly with my dad. Um, and that pitch didn't get picked up. Nobody bought it, which was the first time that had happened to me, which I guess when I say it out loud, it's a ridiculous statement. Hey, hey, way go me that I had sold so many other things. Nothing else I had done got made because there's so many steps. And in this business, if you work in entertainment, um, that's one of the beautiful parts of our business is that you get paid to fail. That's beautiful, you know, whether you're doing stand up or, or uh, writing shows or whatever. Uh, that's how I always look at it. It's like, uh, this is why I want to try new jokes out or work on new materials. That this, I, I get paid to fail. I get paid to try things. I get tra paid to grow. And um, to me, that's beautiful in, in, in what we do. Um, and hopefully that if, if, if you work in another type of field that you, you get to do that as well, that you have a, a boss or you have a company that supports you to push yourself and, and get better. Hey, that's the name of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Everything wraps back into things. Um, so I've been a little bummed out that it didn't sell because, um, you know, everything feels like a personal rejection, when, when, <laughs> especially when I write things that have to do with my life and then one of the reasons one of the networks passed and they were like it's too dark and i was like my life is too dark oh no but i'm still here i survived i'm okay so clearly there's a happy ending i i didn't think it was too dark uh i guess i get it when i go back over it and it's about a, a kid who who's leaving uh, uh south side of chicago because it's full of gangs and then he has to go live with his dad in oregon uh, and his dad was a former drug addict and then now he's getting his life together and he's super churchy and um he has to go live in oregon with a bunch of white people that he never he lives in predominantly black area before and then now he has to live in a full, full like 90 percent white area and with a dad that he barely knows uh and I guess that sounds a little dark, but it sounds interesting to me, but whatever. Um, and I don't mean that negatively. Things happen. People don't, you know, I know, hey, there's no like real, when you fail at things, you, I don't like to get bitter and be like, oh, they didn't pick up my show. I don't ever want to work with them. I'm working with CBS right now. I'm working with them on a um, show uh, called Man With A Plan, with Matt LeBlanc and, and Kevin Nealon, and I come in and I say about five lines, and then I go to my dressing room for several hours, and then I go home. Um, and it's a real jobby job, and I don't particularly feel fulfilled by it, but what it is doing for me is allowing me to stay home for a few weeks. It's allowing me to spend more time with my son. It's allowing me to play Spider-Man. And you can't put a price on playing Spider-Man right now. While everybody else, before all the spoilers get out, I'm knee deep in it at home in my house instead of being on the road somewhere in the middle of the country, which I do love. I love doing stand up, but you know, it seems either I can make money having fun doing stand up, but I gotta be away from my son and the people I love, or I can make money at home working on a show that I don't particularly have a passion about. And so those both make me feel bad. <laughs> but they both make me feel good too. I'm grateful with my life. You know, and I think you gotta have that type of perspective sometimes. But I don't but I also I just wanted to get into that it's not always like 
rosy and it's not just that money makes things happy i'm very you know happy with the amount of money i make and stuff but I, I, again i like being good i like pushing myself and having fun and when i'm just doing a show for two scenes and then i'm spending the rest of the day in my trailer to me i don't go like oh well at least i'm making a bunch of money i'm like oh man i'm not i'm not getting better I'm I'm not pushing myself, and and robot gave me some great advice, which is hey, you're working on a lot of things, and and I have my other project that I've been the one that's my passion project about my son um, raising a child with autism, and that's also a comedy, and I guess that might also be dark depending on how you look at it, um, but it's what I'm really about. And she was like, well, why are you trying to pitch this other show? at the same time um and i was like well because then i could have two shows i could be like whitney cummins i could nail it i could have two shows out there and everybody loves her and he she was like yeah but that probably was a very stressful time for her and if you look back at it i'm gonna ask her i'm gonna get her on the podcast uh but if you look back at it that's probably a time where she was like oh maybe i was doing too much maybe i should have just focused on something i love um i don't know how she feels about that again i'll ask her but i thought that was good advice was to just focus on the thing I truly loved and maybe that them passing on this other show um, is a blessing in disguise because I would be spreading myself too thin Um, either way I have to look at it positively and um, and if it's meant to be it'll come back around because as I told them I don't really write I'm not a guy who's writing like 20 projects like okay what about a family from Mississippi one of them works at a recycling plant the other one's a robot um that's not going to be me um I always just write from my experience in my life and so I'm only gonna have that many options to give you (laughs) so um either that project will be dead or come back around you know it is what it is I'm truly just worried about this project um damn it i said the name of it halston you gotta pull it out um <laughs> i'm worried about this project just because it's what i really want to do i feel like it's my calling it's more important to me than money it's more important to me than um fame or anything like that i don't even really care about that i'm not even going to the emmy party i'm invited to some but guess what it's also bola weekend for pwg pro wrestling gorilla that's the biggest independent wrestling weekend of the year so you think i'm gonna go to emmy parties no i'm gonna be watching joey janela that's what i'm gonna be doing i'm gonna be watching bandito (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because i do what i love and i do what i want to do um so what i realized after talking to robot was that one of the reasons why i was trying to even sell this other project was that i was just so scared that they won't make this project for me that that the uh i guess it's difficult to say when i won't say either project now it's difficult for you to understand what i'm saying uh I have the project about me and my son. That's the thing I care about the most in the world. And in the meantime, I was like, okay, let me work on this other project about my dad and I. And um, I realized I was doing that because I just, I, if uh, the other project didn't go, I was like, oh, I don't have anything. I don't have a focus. I don't have anything I want to do, which is a lot of like how I felt when I first started stand-up. I was afraid to start stand-up because I was like, oh, what if I'm horrible at it? What if I'm not meant to do it? Then I'm wasting my, um, it, it, it seems better for me to just never do it and at least have this hope than do it and then be like oh i sucked and now i don't know what i feel like i'm meant to do in this world and but that was freezing me up from just trying things and failing and and you have to and and no matter what if there is a passion you have and a craft that you want to be good at you're not going to be great from the start you might have natural instincts there might be things that you're you do and you go like oh okay i'm just naturally inclined i i i'm not refined at it but but a part of me is meant to do that and and that's i think is a part of your calling if you believe in that and i do and if you're listening to this podcast you might do too because otherwise you already know i'm a weirdo why are you listening uh so that's part of your calling but either way that's why i always tell people when they ask about 
if I, they should start stand up, I'll say the best thing you can do when you want to start stand up is start. The best thing you want to do with anything is start because no matter what, there is a long road ahead of you. So every day that you're putting off working towards that thing is just adding to that road. So it's better to find out now than to, to just wait your whole life and, and never do what you want to accomplish and wait for later. That's a whole thing. I mean, I think that's what we're taught as a society is like, wait wait for your turn no now is the time for you to sacrifice now is the time for you to go to school now is the time for you to buckle down and get married now is the time for you to for you to own a house you know and a lot of times people are telling you that in your mid-20s that makes no sense to me i don't even know if i want to stay in this shit ass town or wherever i'm at in my mid-20s you know it's ridiculous to me but the, but it but it gets with uh keeping up with the Joneses and 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 staying in this rat race and you see other people have things and you're like oh I should want this thing even if I don't truly want this thing if I don't really find value in these things you know but I but other people have them so I feel like I'm missing out but what is for you is for you and you got to figure that out like. I, I got a good amount of money, but I don't have, you don't see me driving really nice cars. I have a Volkswagen Jetta that I bought from when I was writing on the Kroll show. That was several years ago. Um, the only thing I've done since then was replace the gas cap that got knocked off, I think, the first day I bought it. <laughs> and that took me a couple of years to do that because I don't care about cars like that. I care about wrestling action figures, though. I got a lot of those. I got a lot of video games. Um, so, you know, what do you care about? Put your money into that, be about that. And, um, I say all of that to just wrap back into what I was talking about where it's like, I'm, I'm just afraid they won't pick up this project about me and my son. It's making me stressed out. Um, it's making me eat pints of ice cream. Um, I'm not coping in positive ways. I'm doing better than before. Before I, like when I, um, didn't know if I was going to be able to get this house, like I was eating full boxes of cereal. So like now, like being like half a pint of ice cream is is going forward. But I also know this is part of my cycle of not dealing with my anxieties, which is why I'm seeing a therapist now, which again, I fully, I would just encourage you, if you got issues, don't try to hide them. Don't try to deny them. You know, nobody's perfect and just build yourself out. And I think that's one thing I've been, um, wanting to push out a little bit more that I didn't know if I did the last couple of weeks is that positivity isn't always just about being cocky and sure of yourself and thinking that you're going to nail it. Like, like a lot of times I've gotten some feedback there where people are like, Oh, you're very cocky or you're very confident. And, and they think that it means that I'm not scared. I'm scared all the time. I'm scared every show that I do because I want to do well. I want to get better. I want to move forward in my art. And if I'm not doing that, I'm scared that I'm going backwards. Um, I'm scared that I'm going to be stuck doing clubs with, you know, 6 a.m. press and for the rest of my life. I don't want to do that. That's not a goal of mine. It's never anything I want to do. I'm afraid that I'm going to be stuck doing guest spots on TV shows that I don't want to really be on. I don't want to do that. You know, no matter how much money you get, a job is still a job and a passion is your passion, you know, like and I'm blessed to be in the position that I am and nobody wants to hear me. I complain. I'm lucky I'm black. So I got that, you know, it's like there's always a threat of my life being taken from me. So people are like, okay, let's hear him out a little bit. But other than that, I live in um yeah we always take that out i live in los angeles uh i live uh i have a great family my my everything is great nobody wants to hear me complain i got nothing to complain about you know but nobody wants to go like oh man he's upset because they didn't want him to ad lib yay instead of goody because who says goody well, there's no black man in the world that says goody says frankie lyman and he said the song goody goody and he he said those together he didn't even just say goody um maybe sam goody if he was a black man but i don't think he was but i was like hey i don't think black people say goody and they were like okay let me go talk to this person who has to go talk to this person who has to go talk to this person and then we'll let you know if you could not say goody and that's just not what i'm about i love words i love messing with them i love playing with them i love people who trust me to do that and so that's what i want to do and that's why i want my own show i want to get my words out i don't think these things are too dark 
I love writing from a real perspective and from a perspective of, of pain and, and going through things because I think that is more relatable than pretending that problems don't exist. That makes no sense to me, especially now in this day and age to just be like, everything's okay and we're all friends. Like friends, what sense would friends make today? Oh, we're all chill and everybody's cool and we got a monkey. Go fuck yourself. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your traumas. That's what I care about and make them funny. Just don't be mopey about it. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, tomorrow, I actually shall find out whether or not um, they're going to pick up the show about my son or I, or, or not even if they pick it up, or whether it's dead or not. Um, they could still say some other things and not pick it up. But we will find out tomorrow for sure if it is dead. And so I'm stressing about that. But I'm also, um, I'm driven about it. Because I'm like, no matter what, I'm going to make it because I believe in it a lot. Somebody will make it with me. Because it's what I want to do. It's what I need to do. And I think that's what the difference is. I'm not cocky. I'm driven. I believe in that even if you tell me. There's no reason to, to believe in it. And I've been like that since I was super, super poor. Since I was in the south side of Chicago, you know, living with my mom and in, in an abusive household with her boyfriend and, and just talking with my sister and just being like, look, we're going to be okay because... We're, we're special people and we're meant to do things and we're, and we're going to be okay. And for a long time, I thought I was wrong about that because I was in my 18 and 20s. I'm like, oh, it's, nothing has changed. Everything's still horrible. But it's because I wasn't moving towards those goals. I was just expecting things to happen to me. I was just expecting my life to get better because my life had been bad through no fault of my own. And that's just not how things work. Nobody owes you anything. But a lot of times the universe will meet you halfway. If you if you put in that effort, and uh, I think that pretty much wraps up my beginning of my day. We'll talk to a good friend of mine. Um, his name's Billy Wayne Davis. He's a wonderful comedian. Um, he just started his journey in acting class. We go to the same acting coach. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about comedy. Uh, we'll talk about he's a big proponent of spirituality, getting better himself. So we'll talk about that, uh, and we'll be right back with Billy Wayne Davis. <laughs> We're oh, okay. good. What's up, Billy Wayne? Hey, Ron. Welcome to the show. It's good to be on the show. You were just talking about Doug Benson and him not recognizing me as the champion of At Midnight? I think he does, but it's like reluctant. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I get his point because he technically has more victories than yeah. I, but he also has been on like twice as many times as I was on. And then he did admit that you beat him like in the tournament of champions. Yes, he brought him. that up too. I he's like, I head couldn't head beat him head to head. And he's like, he's got that voice in the way. And I was like, yeah, it's, he's funnier. That's the <laughs> yeah, it's like it, Doug. Come on the podcast. What's up, Billy Wayne? How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Let's talk a bit about you. Um, I know that you're you're from Nashville, right? Or you're not from Nashville? I'm, no, that's. But I would claim that it's fine. I'm mm -hmm. like it's Crossville, Tennessee, is where I'm from, which is like an hour and a half east of Nashville. Mm -hmm. So. But I met you in Seattle, Seattle, Washington, yes. if I remember correctly, Yeah, um, several years ago, probably like maybe six, seven, eight years ago. Maybe 10, if we're being honest. Wow, man, we're getting old. Because it's like 2018. Ooh. I know. I don't like that. I, I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's fun. You're right in that regard. People, all, we were talking about this on my uh, girlfriend's birthday is that people whenever especially when you're a woman uh, and people say your birthday they go like you're still 21 you're like, oh, yeah you're still forever 21 and it's just like i would never want to be 21 again never in a million when i was 22 i didn't want to be 21 again when i was 21 i had a one-year-old son and i didn't know he had autism oh. all i knew was that he didn't listen to me unless he heard the theme song to elmo's world first that's pretty cool, though. It is pretty cool, but I it's mean, stressful. I was going to say, that is crazy stressful, but also, I think it's a blessing that you were smart enough to realize, like, his patterns. Yeah. Because a lot of people can't. That's a good point. Thank you. So, that, that's a blessing that a lot of people don't pick up on patterns like that. So, that's... And at 21, I wasn't anywhere near that kind of responsibility. I was getting hammered drunk. I was still figuring out what I wanted to do. Did you know what you wanted to do? I knew that I wanted to be in comedy, but I was not of confident enough to say it. I 
watched a lot of comedy. Um, if you talked to me, you probably didn't enjoy it because I never listened to you mm-hmm. and I never talked to you about a thing. I just would turn everything into a joke or a phrase or turn a phrase. I'd look for, a, um, I would look for you to make a conversation mistake and then I'd jump on it. And so I was basically just a shitty person. But not, I understand exactly what you're talking about is that you're trying to prove how funny you were at all times mm-hmm. because that's the only way you knew. Yeah, no. And when I think I was in the same spot, but didn't know that comedy was an option. I had decided I was going to play professional baseball and then played for two years in college and realized that I didn't even, I think I could have played for money. You have the voice for it. Without a doubt. And the name <laughs> helps too. Yes. <laughs> the, yes. And the build and all that. Yes. I understand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I could, I could walk on any baseball field. No one would kick me off. <laughs> they were just like, he's supposed to be here <laughs> to this day. Yes. Uh, But once I figured out, like, I didn't even want to do that, let alone the ability or anything. That was the hardest part for me to realize was like, oh, you guys play baseball all day, every day for the rest of your life. I, there's too much out there for Mm -hmm. me. And then for two years, I didn't know what I wanted. I knew I was funny. And like you said, like, I love comedy. If I was in my house, I was watching Saturday Night Live or Mr. Show or stand up or something. It fascinated me. But, like, I was in Kentucky. That wasn't an option to be funny for a living. And then this girl said, you should try it. And I tried it. Because the girl told you to? Was Mm -hmm. she pretty? Yeah, we had been dating. And then between the time I signed up for an open mic and went to the open mic, we broke up. But I'm still (laughs) thankful for her. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was mad at her for a long time. Oh, I know what you mean. I mean, a lot of times, sometimes, and I think it's not just, you know, women, but I think um, if someone truly has feelings for you, it cares for you, sometimes they can see the best in you before you can. Yes. And so if they're like, oh, you're really funny. You should try this. Yeah. And, And you never even see that, you know, yourself. You're like, oh, like, you know, um, one of the things uh, we'll probably get into relationships later but you know when I was married you know um, it was more always like me trying to overcome and prove that I'm you're like you're gonna be like your dad or you're like this or this or that or their expectations yeah yeah and and I was with, in a negative relationship and so I was always trying to prove myself and like I'm a good guy or da, da, da. and then now that I've um, dated more women who've been more supportive and they're like no you're a good guy but you're also you can be this or you could do this and, and and you have this kindness about you that i like that, that that not a lot of men have or this or that and you're just like oh you learn more about yourself from being in good relationships and our bad relationships are but sometimes you need other people's perspectives or treats to see yourself wholly or make you realize that you it's something that you are passionate about and it's not just like a you know what i mean like you don't realize because i think a lot of times i thought comedy was just a release Mm -hmm. for me like a stress reliever like i didn't have to think about stuff it made me laugh and then yeah like she she pointed out she was like well when you speak in front of people, you you always do it in a funny way. Mm-hmm. You're never serious. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh. And are you like, because there's one thing, like the the girl I'm seeing, and, and um, she's still an up-and-coming writer and still working at things. And, then, and, and so she'll be like, oh, I'm not like, you know, one of you guys or that or that. And I'm like, no, like, do you hear the way? I don't know people who talk about comedy like this. I don't know people who are passionate like this. Sure, they're fans yeah. of things, but it's like you are much more than that and you're funny. It's like, I, I can see that, you know? And, and Yeah. It's cool. It's just fun. It is fun. I mean, well, what you were saying earlier, like, the people that, I think it was such a good thing you were saying earlier that we get caught up in at 25, you're supposed to have this and then you're supposed to have a house and you're supposed to. And I think for some people that is great because if you're going to go into certain walks of life, you should already have those things and Mm -hmm. the stability that you need. Mm -hmm. But the options, 
that you're told how to live our life. And I was just talking about this with somebody. A friend of mine was like, had come into money for the first time in his life. And he was like, ask, asking how to handle it and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm not the best person, <laughs> you know, because I don't have a lot of it. I just am decent at handling the little bit I do. I'm going to try to get, you know, I'm constantly trying to get more and put it away. But he was, he just said, it's messed up. They don't teach us how to budget or any of this in school. And I was like, yeah, the people that have all the money don't want people to know how to handle it. Yes. And you could just see his eyes where he's like, oh, I was like, yeah, that's, so you have to want to do certain things to improve your life. And I, I think that's hugely important. That's something that I'm starting to get into now. Like I had a, um, I have a business manager, but I wasn't really involved in it. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of things happened where I was like, oh, okay. Um, where they didn't pay some bills in the, in the fashion that I thought they should. Um, and I was like, oh. I want to be involved. I yeah. want to be more involved with my money. I want to know about my money. It's one of my favorite subjects, mm -hmm. so I should know more about it. I want to be involved in investing. I want to not miss out on things. I don't want to invest a shit ton of money, but I want to. I want to diversify yes. your funds. Yes. yes, yes. Which just used to sound like a funny punchline to me, but as you get older, you're like, oh no, that's just the smart way to do things. And like I didn't, I don't think either of us came from money. No, we both came from poor people. Uh, yeah, my mom lives in my back house. <laughs> I know I, she was asleep this afternoon and made me happy. Yeah, she's was been like, drinking. You take, you take that nap. Yeah, you earn this. She's uh, been partying a lot. I basically have two teens now. Do you? Yeah. Well, she's earned it. Yeah, she yeah, cash, she, she's cashing in that check she put in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. She was working a lot, taking care of me and my sister. Now she should just get to chill out. And that does that make you feel awesome? It does make me feel awesome. Uh, sometimes I get jealous because it feels like I work and then I just leave and then mm -hmm. everybody else gets to enjoy what I work for. Which know? I think she did that for a while. Eh, okay, but whose you know side what, are you, you know, on? I'm just saying, I, as a parent, everything always changes now because you can't talk mad shit to your parents because you're like, I know what you're going through. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I had a thing where I came home. Um, I got a bottle of um, Dom Perignon from on my birthday um, that was given to me by a comic friend who doesn't know that I don't drink. So, yeah. you know, but I was like, oh, Still cool, a great gift. gift. Nice gift. Yeah. Thank you. And so it's just been sitting there. And then I came, my sister and her, her husband came to visit while I was out of town. Um, and then I just come back and there's just like, empty champagne glasses and the empty bottle of Don Perignon and I don't have like I, I was like I don't even have a leg to stand on it's like I would have not drank in that I like, but it's still nice to have it sitting there because it's like money do you yeah, know what I mean yeah <laughs> yeah so I'm a little bit mad they, 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 they just came to my house and were just like oh let's crack open the Don P and just kick back while Ron's fucking working he's acting it's all good <laughs> that's yes <laughs> It is, it is funny, like, but I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about because the first plant I grew, like the marijuana plant I grew, I let the jar sit there for like a week before I even touched it just because I was like, look at that. Look what I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't do shit. I just would water it every now and then. You know what I mean? But it was still like, and then I, when I started smoking it, I would give it to people. And then when they'd smoke it all, I'd be like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> it was this opposite because you'd want them yeah, to you gotta now smell it and enjoy yeah, it yeah they're like yeah i'm high i'm like but it's i know you guys are right and now i think about that when i buy weed i'm like i wonder if the growers like they don't appreciate what i'm doing well i appreciate it shout out to burner shout uh -huh. out to the f good family at cookies I, I love you guys if you if you um i know you work with a lot of rappers if you need a comedian um i'm your boy Funches Just, is your I'll, boy. I'll, I'll be there We've been smoking weed before. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Sketches, skits, uh, <laughs> whatever you need. Um, that's our only plug of the day. Um, really went. Okay. So I met you in Seattle. Yes. And one of the best, one of the weirdest events I ever met you around was that, was at your house and then someone just like OD'd on something. Do you know who that was? No. Vince Avril. Oh yeah. Vince. George's husband. Oh yeah. Uh, that was after a bumber shoot, right? Yes. Because we like walked down. Because I lived like a block or two away from where they do bumber shoot. And which was like, you know, it wasn't planned or anything. But when that, you know, you move across the country and then you realize like, I moved into like a kind of cool part of town. Mm -hmm. uh, 
What brought you from Nashville to Seattle? I was uh, touring with Ralphie May. I had just started touring with him, and I was like two or three years into comedy. And he was nice enough to be like, this kid kind of has a thing. I'm going to show him stuff. And he showed me a lot that he probably didn't mean to show me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I learned more about what not to do. What do you mean? Can you be more specific, or do you not want to? I mean, he's passed on, so I don't think he can say shit now. But, uh, and it's not, I'm not talking out of place. It was, I watched him get really famous, and I saw the traps that come with all that, and then all the money, and all the traps that come with that. Mm -hmm. And then the delusions that come with certain things if you buy into certain hype and all that yeah i think i mean i don't get a lot of it um mostly because i'm only very 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 mildly famous yeah um but you still get those people like even now when i'm working on this show and i say like i literally say two lines one of them is a punchline, and then you get off the set and they're like you're amazing you're a genius and it's just like i didn't do anything what do you mean yeah what do you mean everybody's a genius because you hear us throwing around so much you're a genius you're a genius and to me that's one of these words i think we talked about on the podcast before that is one of the traps where you can get caught up where you think you're better than someone um and i don't think you should ever do that i don't ever feel that i'm better than anyone or less than anyone i'm i'm like you're no my biggest one of my biggest mantras is hey i'm no better than you but god damn it you're no better than me uh we're the same we're equal and uh when you get caught up in this like i'm a genius and, and i'm amazing you get then you don't have this like thing catching you from making mistakes and saying the wrong things you're like everything i do is great that's we- yes and that's not true to, about anybody mm-hmm. like you're talking about genius i got to work with sasha baron cohen on that who is america thing mm-hmm. that guy and people come up to me like is he's a comedic genius and they like, no, 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 i think he's like an actual genius we're like he's just smart he's like highly intelligent and that's what and but he doesn't have that thing that a lot of comedians that are considered geniuses have where it's like they can't turn it off Mm -hmm. and they have to everything's a joke Mm -hmm. his is he he's soaking up everything from everybody and that's what i learned the most from watching him was like he's listening all the time and then letting people be and to me that's He's a comedic genius. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And that's that's a lot of what his work is, is revealing your true self in front of him. Yes. That's what his comedy is a lot about. So that makes a lot of sense that him as a person would be more of like a a listener. Without a doubt. But at the same time knows what works and doesn't work, Mm -hmm. which I think is... People call that, you know, I think arrogance and confidence are mistaken a lot in our business, if that makes sense. I think it does, because to me, arrogance usually is a marker of fear. Yes. It's a marker of, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to overconfident. So I'm going to puff up, keep people away from me, make them feel less than me. Anyone that I've worked with like that has always been someone where I'm like, oh, you're not even really that talented. Yeah. And then I work with someone who's truly talented, who has done a lot of things, whether it's been like a, a Bill Lawrence or, or something like that, where, and I go like, oh, they're confident. Yeah. Because they've seen it work, and they know things, and they don't know everything, and they've seen themselves fail. But they're not like, hey, I'm better than you. you yeah. Know? It's like, I've been doing this thing longer than you. Mm-hmm. So I have certain advantages. That that's... Yes, and I try to do that when I'm doing stand up. Any new person, when they're like, "Is there any?" It always cracks me up. But they're like, "Is there anything I should or shouldn't say before you?" And like, "No, if you're gonna be funnier than me, that's my fault." Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's another thing. Ralph, a gift Ralphie gave me was like, "Say and do anything you want to do in front of me. I can follow it." And any headliner that says they can't shouldn't be headlining. I agree with that. I and never, I, I, I never do heart. that at all. I've I've heard people say that, and that's always cracks me up. I'm like, whoa, you have people who legitimately are like, hey, don't talk about this or don't talk yeah. about that, and it's just like, oh. And I've had people where I'm like, sometimes it's helpful for me because if I see the MC doing jokes 
in the same vein that I'm doing, then I got to go like, oh, either either of these are just really well-worn topics and maybe I should stay away from them because everybody's going to have a joke about this or I need to look more inside at myself. You know, it's not a marker of like, don't do those jokes. It's more like, oh, what can I do to either make sure I'm my joke is way different from that or maybe this is a topic that everybody's doing in, in, this, in this idea that I thought was so unique isn't and I should just drop it. Yeah, or it's just it's just a timely joke that you're going to put in your live act because I do a lot of that. Like the first ten to f- ten minutes of my act is usually about the town I'm in or mm-hmm. what just happened. I need to start doing that. I don't really do that much. I guess I don't need to. I know I said that. I was just seems very defensive. Like I was just like, you're doing something I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just something that I like it because I like towns. So mm-hmm. when I'm driving through cities and stuff, it it comes naturally to me but it also is any tape i have the first 10 minutes i can't give to anybody because it's like yeah that was that was 15 gold minutes on humboldt county that <laughs> only play to the lost coast you know what i mean yeah no but i understand that but it's always just a joy in having fun and not everything is about building towards you making money off of it it's just like i'm an artist and i want to have fun and i want to um, one of the things I've been struggling with lately is that I shot my special and then now I'm like, oh, I don't really have that much new material and nothing's having happened to me much life wise, but I still have dates. I've been talking about this. Okay, this is on the special. Say, you my bought house a house. Is, yeah, that's, that's a pretty special. big life. Thing. That's on the special. Okay. Um, but t- but I, <laughs> but there are other things that I need to yeah I need to just be like just write and get it out and be in the moment and so I'm I'm trying to do that more and more. Can um, I suggest? Just one thing please this is what i found those old ideas you had that you were like you're really excited about when you first started doing stand-up and then you drop them because they never got what you wanted go back now and look at some of those because i've done that recently and there's like two things where i'm like oh that was good i just didn't know how to do it yeah i wasn't ready for it yeah because like i was having that same panic too because you're like i don't have any new material and you're like wait i got some old stuff i never did yeah and yeah. it's still universal it was like these universal ideas and mm-hmm. now my perspectives changed just enough it's like when you're playing a video game and you got loot that was too high of a level for you to use yet and you just had to level up and now you're like boom these gauntlets look dope now it's well and it's like when you look down you're like oh i've already been on stage 50 minutes i've still mm-hmm. got 15 more minutes i want to talk about yeah that's a oh fun. yeah no that's that's when i was like okay now it's time to that's usually where i'm like it's time to catalog it and move on because i'm like doing an hour without even stressing about it or trying and i still have material left over you're up there doing an hour 10 hour 15 mm-hmm. you're like and that's too much time. yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah you don't want to be out there paul mooney in it it's doing two too much. three hours i don't care how funny you are it's not a good idea i think that's so rude and i tell you the day i figured it out was i was doing a show i think it was with paul mooney and i could hear people in the kitchen going like as there as he kept going into his hour and hour and a half two hours and, and then one lady was just like well, that's the last bus. I'm not going to uh, not going to make the bus. I'm going to have to walk or get a ride. And I was like, "Oh, when you do stuff like that, you're affecting a lot of people. Like you you can't just be that egotistical to just take over a whole show like that and, and you're affecting not just the opener or the host who has to close out the show. You're affecting people who are just the waitresses the staff i was gonna say the wait staff they don't get tipped right because the people are mad and tired and yeah not drunk anymore because that yeah. was another thing that i watched some people i've watched remember that period of time when like dane cook and Chappelle were doing that thing where like Chappelle did eight hours the mm-hmm. other night i remember everyone's like that's crazy i'm like yeah that is crazy that's stupid and it's the most self-indulgent thing I've ever heard. And like people listen, yeah. you're like, yeah, because that's an it's an event. That I also gonna- get it in the regards of like, I'm just gonna babble, and I I later this will be good. Yeah, but now it's not. No, but people should say that. But people, people say didn't it. say that. Yeah. They were like, no, it was awesome. He talked for eight hours. And you're like, I don't know anyone who I would want to listen to talk for eight straight hours. No, because at one point I'm just like, hey. 
Did are you all gonna stop in the middle and have yeah, sex? I'm, what are you? <laughs> Cause I'm hungry now. And yes. Are we gonna do something else between us? Could you smoke weed in the room? Because that's <laughs> eight hours. That's a. I mean, I know Dave does, but no one else can. Yeah, that's rude. That's very rude. That is my thing. That's my only complaint with him smoking everywhere he wants. Is like you should at least like let get your boys to be able to smoke or something yeah. you know you can't be the only one i've been on both sides of that and i gotta say when you're on stage and you can't smoke and other people can't it is a thrill it's a great thrill it feels good it makes you feel like you made a lot of good life decisions um usually i, I still hand I the joint to the crowd and then i get and then they're like hey don't do that it's oh fun. yeah they get mad at yeah. that oh, yes yeah, yeah. no but smoking weed on stage yeah there is something magic even when it's legal you're still like this is amazing i've earned something and i don't know what it is but it feels <laughs> <laughs> billy um how are you um you've been doing stand-up for how long now 14 years i think it was 20 21 when i did my first open mic and i consider that starting stand-up because oh, cool. once i started i never looked back yeah i've been like that too you always hear people and they tell you and they go but i took a couple years break or you know which I, is fine but um i think it was also because i had my son and when I started, I was, and, and my mom was very much like, hey, if you're going to do this. You should do it. Yeah, be serious about it. For me, it was, like I said, I was like in, I didn't realize I was in a depression, but I was. Because I was just partying in college. And college, was, the school wasn't hard for me. The work wasn't. Um, I was just sad. Because I didn't know what I wanted to do. But that first five minutes, like three minutes in, I felt this weight lift off of me where I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. You found your calling. Oh, I got chills just talking about it because <laughs> it was like that moment where I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Yeah. And after that, it was like any of the heart. Like I look back, like I lived on a couch for eight months and I still look back and I'm like, it wasn't bad. I had the most fun doing stand up every night. I yeah, I remember that, that the time period when I when I would see you around Seattle it was a uh, um I look back at it and I go, Okay, maybe I made some bad decisions. Like I was rude in the way I handled things. Like a lot of times I I would go up and do gigs. I remember doing the Seattle competition and getting a ride up to Seattle and like not knowing not knowing how I was gonna eat, not knowing how I was gonna get back to Oregon. Like I just was like, I'm gonna figure it out. Yeah. And I'm gonna get, and then I got a ride back with someone into Portland, and they were later on. I found out they were very mad, and they were like, really? "Get your shit together!" And so, because oh. I'm being a burden on other people, and that's not nice to do. Where were you also doing well, and they weren't? No, I. I mean, you mean comedically? Yeah. yeah. No, that's most of it. Because <laughs> if you both would have sucked, they'd be like, "Get in the car, man! This sucks we're for everybody." Together. You're doing good. And they're like, "This asshole is fucking winning." And don't have any money. And you're like, yeah, because that's all I have. Yeah. I was just talking to Aaron about this. Aaron's my <gasps> fiance, wife. Um, baby. Oh, yeah, we're having a baby, too. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm, I haven't seen you. I saw her. Yeah. And I saw her belly. She needs the congratulations more than I do because I already have one. Yeah. Nine. Yeah, you already did it. So it's like people are like you don't seem excited i'm like oh i'm past celebration i moved on to preparation mode yeah because she doesn't know what's coming <laughs> and everyone i tell that has a kid laughs at that and people that don't they're like why are you being mean to aaron i'm like oh i'm not being mean i'm just she just there's no way for her to know there is no way unless you go through it yeah and then you're like oh this is it's like Navy SEAL shit. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. But, um, but I've been thinking now. I mean, now it's so it's fun, though, because you're at a good... How old were you when you had y y your son? I was 28. Okay. 27. A lot older than me. Yeah, but still not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't ready for that and got thrust into it, and it was in a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, our son is fantastic, and I'm very, very fortunate and lucky, but... There was like some really dark times that you have to go through. You don't have to, but I did. Whereas like that test of, and a lot of people in comedy didn't understand either what I was going through because I didn't talk about it. So like, but I mean, I was just saying this to Aaron too. There's two things I was just saying to Aaron was like, we're working on this show that is about 
stand up and how to handle it if you really want to do it and have a family you mm-hmm. know what i mean where are they these sacrifices you have to make and what's important it was like and i didn't mean to start crying i was just talking to the director that wants to do it and it, it was like one of those things where you once you go through something when you're just pushing to get through it and then you look back on it and you realize how truly painful it was mm-hmm. like i was i just and i just tears just started pouring because i was like if i didn't have stand up at that time i might have not made it mm-hmm. like that was the one thing in my life that was consistent and i could show up and do that no i feel that's this i mean i feel for so many people they're calling whether it's music or or um stand up or or, or something else or sports or yeah. whatever it, it you do find that they were like, oh, it saved my life. Without a doubt. It's saying, and it know. sounds dramatic, but it's... <laughs> no, it definitely did for me many times when I was growing up as a kid and living in an abusive household and, and hearing all these um, just, just... I mean, there was a lot of things. I remember there's times where Christmas would mean like my mom's boyfriend was busting through the window and knocking over our Christmas tree and or my birthday. Like I had a birthday where I had a sleepover where he came busting through the window and grabbed my mom in front of my friends. And I was like... So you just had a problem with doors? Yeah, yeah. He, like yeah, a, he didn't like the doors. Yeah. <laughs> He's a windows guy. And... Um, I'm sorry. But I had... I love... Like, I had I Love Lucy. I had Benny Hill. And I had these things where it was like, these guys are having fun. Which I guess is a good way to... I mean, because I was talking about earlier that I don't like it when people don't want to deal with things in comedy. But there is something about escapism mm-hmm. that those shows had that is that is wonderful. You know? Yeah. I do like that about a good multicam sitcom. I, t- I love a good multicam sitcom because once you... If they do it right and you invest in those characters... I mean, The Office... Sometimes that theme song to The Office makes me cry because it was one of those consistent things during mm-hmm. a very dark, lonely time in my yeah, life. Yeah, I have that for me. It's like the show Home Movies as well as um, The Office and um, Arrested Development, mm-hmm. like just playing those DV here in the beginning of the DVD loops because um, the same way, um, a lot of times when my marriage was falling apart and, and things were very toxic, it was like, oh, at least I can go do a set. I can go do a show. Yeah. I can, um, I have this to keep me together. To focus and I can get better at this. And if I can get better at this, I can get better at the other parts of my life. Yeah. And I can start examining. But that becomes a part of it, right? Where you do need, you can't just focus on your passion and watch the rest of your life fall apart. Because it'll fall apart. It will. Yeah. Because, and that's, if you're doing your passion correctly, to me, you're, my, my mom is an English teacher. My dad's a, I call him, he's a high school football coach and teacher. Um, hmm. But I, I, he's, my dad's amazing. I got very, 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 very lucky. He's, I call him like a far-sighted Buddha because he's got glasses, but he's just chill. And he's always taught me there's two sides to everything. I thought it was going to be because he really liked that comic strip, The Far Side. No, but yeah, he probably does. He has a great sense of humor. I looked like I was blessed because he loved quality stuff. Mm-hmm. So he and like Richard Pryor and all this stuff. So it was like, oh, um, that must be. I mean, I don't want to interrupt you. You continue to think about. It. I'll circle back. Go ahead. Now I'm interested in what you have to say, but <laughs> it was. I forgot what I was. What the point I was making was that. Okay, well, yeah, I it's okay. It I'm happened. sorry, I yeah. fucked you up. This is no, what my girlfriend says about me that I always interrupt and then I set myself the flow. I say that about Aaron, so mm. so we should hang out as a couple. We and me should. And, me and Robot can hang out, and you and Aaron can interrupt each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say that's interesting to me. I mean, but I guess it maybe is just bias of me to think that in the South and in, in, in Nashville or, or Tennessee in general, where you're like, where you go, like your dad's like Richard Pryor. You oh, know, because yeah. to me, that'd be something where you'd be concerned that maybe there'd be racism and people don't want you to, uh, who, who don't understand that you would like that type of thing. Oh, without a doubt, the South is, I mean, in my new, I, like the new stuff I'm working on, I'll talk about it, but it is like, I talk about the South, it's like, and this is just one line from the little bit I do, is like, the South is, they're like, what is the South really like? I'm like, well, there's like five or six cities that are the coolest places you've ever been, full of the coolest people you've ever seen and been around. And then the rest of it is exactly what you've heard about. 
because it is that kind of terrible. The town I grew up in didn't have black people, mm-hmm. but we had a lot of racism, which I remember being young. That's generally the case. Exactly. Because and if I remember you have be- black people, you can't, you gotta be like, well, what do you mean? Like, Jerry's great. Well, that's it. That's what I never understood as like, growing up was like, how can you hate people we don't know? We don't know any black. I hate Kevin because Kevin did some bullshit last week. That's who <laughs> I don't like is Kevin. I don't know any black people, so I can't hate black people. But that was, and I would talk about my to my parents about it. And you know, my dad's a football coach. He'd be like, no, it would be great if we had black people. <laughs> We'd win more games. We would win a game, you know, kind of thing. It's like, it'd be nice to toss it to somebody that was fast, you know, that kind yeah, of stuff. That was part of the show I was trying to pitch. And is that when I moved to Oregon, they tried to put me on every <laughs> varsity team until they figured it out. <laughs> I remember being in college and being like, Hey, not all black people are athletic. This is, a lot of them are not athletic at all. Mm-mm. That was like, I remember guys on our baseball team in college uh, because I had questions and I got along with black people really quickly because we were similar. We liked music, the same kind of music, and we liked to laugh. And a lot of white people really uptight. So I would hang out with the black people and then I would have questions about the hair and just things I didn't know. And the white guys on the team, like from Louisville and stuff like the bigger cities were like, you're racist. And the black guys were like, he's not racist. You're racist. He's curious. <laughs> There's no hate in his heart. And I was like, I don't hate anybody. I don't like you right now. But you know, that kind of stuff. So there was like a lot of confusion. So I just wanted to leave my town. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And baseball was the first way I got to travel. I remember being in high school playing American Legion, base, American Legion baseball in the summer. And I was leaving the state to go play in the weekends and stuff. And I was like, oh, I like this. I get to go meet and see different people. And then I played baseball for a couple of years. It wasn't what I wanted it to or what I thought it was going to be. Also, people were on steroids. Mm-hmm. And that was like around that time where I realized like, oh, steroids is not cheating. It's the way. Yeah, it's what you got to do to make it. And I was like, I can't. Because guys I was better than naturally, we get on steroids and I couldn't compete anymore. And Mm -hmm. I was like, fuck this. Uh, And then stand up and then you just start. I just knew when you're talking about getting better. Oh, that's circling back. That's what I wanted to say about my parents was like, I learned... I was constantly taught to improve upon yourself because my mom's an English teacher. My dad's a football coach. My grandfather was a, he came from nothing. I went to the shack he was born in with nine brothers and sisters and he owned, he died a millionaire from cattle and working for the Tennessee Valley authority. We didn't realize he was a millionaire, but that's what any farmer, most of the big ones are Mm -hmm. fucking millionaires. Uh, but you wouldn't know it, but you just approve, you improve upon in being that focus on stand up made me realize at one point after all the dark times, Oh, I've plateaued at stand up. For some reason, I'm not getting the jump that everyone else is that I know I'm just as good, if not more talented than mm-hmm. and work is hard. And then I, that's why I quit drinking. Mm-hmm. And then I ran my mouth so much I changed my diet because it was to get better at stand up, but also improve my life. And I realized, like, oh, I have to improve my life to improve my career. Absolutely. And you have to do these things. And it was like every day. And once you you start realizing there's these building blocks, little small steps. I was running my mouth about changing my diet and how healthy I was. And then I was doing research to talk shit about gun control. And I realized that smoking cigarettes is like the number one killer. <laughs> and I've been, that's why I quit smoking cigarettes. Cause just so I could talk more shit. <laughs> you just wanted to be able to fulfill your moral superiority. It, without a doubt. <laughs> and, and it's that thing too. And I, like I evaluate, I was like, is that the right motivation? And I was like, who cares if it's the right motivation that yeah, the result is I good. I think that's brilliant. That's one of the things I try to do. Is and that's one of the things where I go, I'm a leading man, and and where I had been failing in the last week, where I'm like eating 
things that I shouldn't be eating and, 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 and because I was like, oh, you're not believing. But if you need to tell yourself, um, whether again, you're an actor or a comedian, or if you're just at your job and you're seeing like lunch come in and, and it's company Friday lunch and everybody's eating tacos and, and drinking soda and sweet tea and, and you're trying to been working on your diet and working on your health, but you're like, oh, everybody else is eating this. Tell yourself you're better than them. Yeah. You're because not, you are in that moment. Yeah. If you need to say that and in order to not fall into it, I mean, I do it all the time. I go, okay, that's for you. That's not for me because I'm a leading man. I'm just, I'm just stopping through. We want different things. Yes. That's another thing. I, that's a nicer way to motivate yeah. myself. And it's taken me a while to get there because I'm competitive. You know that we play in that basketball league. Um, <laughs> I have a hard time turning it off. Um, <laughs> And that's why I don't play golf because I've played it a couple of times and I realize like I'm too competitive to get involved in this. This will take up too much time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that well, and it's like I was saying this the other day was like someone was talking about how much money some celebrity gave or rich person gave to charity. And they're like, yeah, but they only do that for the tax breaks. And I was like, who cares the motivation that charity got a bunch of money mm-hmm. just because that guy got a tax break who cares if he's doing it because that it's still the end result is good. Isn't that good? Yes. So not every, I mean, I think that's a problem we're having in society right now is everyone has to be, everyone is acting like they're righteous. Yes. Like they're without sin. There's a lot of glass house living. Right Absolutely. Now. But more than ever when in anything, I mean, I think, the truth is that we're we're all trying to pull ourselves out of the mud no none of us are are fully clean there's just things i wish i had I'd never done and and situations i wish i was never in and just like i'm sure there are with you just like <laughs> sure there are with halston but it's yeah um, he says one, <laughs> one time? it's impressive <laughs> but it's still I mean, young but we also removing that that whole thing of like I know not to walk into certain rooms now because I've walked in certain rooms. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Does that make sense? Yes. Is you like, know how to not put yourself. You know how to read a situation and go, okay, I've seen this before. I know the <laughs> outcomes here. I should probably go home. I'm gonna get the fuck out of this. Yeah, that's one of my main things. Is why I always am like, look, I am about what I'm about. Some people say it's childish. You're like, oh, you're just wrestling and video games or whatever. I'm gonna go, look. I'm about what I'm about. My dad. Is a, it, my dad's a high school football coach. I can't talk to him during the fall because it's going to be about football. <laughs> He's, he'll be 61, 62. That's a childish thing. But 35 years, that's mm-hmm. not, you know what I mean? Yeah. But they wouldn't, most people wouldn't view that as a childish thing. Well, my dad is a football coach and he spent his adult life playing sports. But they look at your wrestling and they're like, that's childish. I was like, it's not. Like, I wasn't a video game guy until my son got into video games. And then I was like, oh, I see. This isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you figured out how to make it. To me, that's what success is. And I get, sometimes we get caught up in, like, the monetary part of success. And I know I do. Because I was upset last year. You know how we compare each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our, our friends to it. You know, was like, well, mm-hmm. they's making a ton of money, blah blah. And, and Aaron just pointed out, she's like, you've made a ton of money. You just had to give it to your ex wife and lawyers. And I was like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. that's okay. And in some ways, that's motivating, though. Oh, I because I've done the same where I had to pay off I my had that my money, ex and my lawyer. And, yeah, and I just go, oh, okay, I'm gonna go get that again. Yes. I can get it. Yeah. 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 And that's one of the best things is this to me it's not, especially when it's a skill based job or based off of writing or acting or, or whatever you were doing. It, it's not lucky. If you did it once, you should, if you're a good person and you should, you weren't a shitty coworker, yeah. you should be able to go do it again. And so you should, there should be more money out for you and you, and you know more. You should. Yes. It, yeah, and I'm not, it's just that realization of like, oh, now I've had to say no to some stuff because of my accent and what they want me to do with it. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, even Aaron's like, well, it's just acting. Like, it's not because they put my name on it. 
it's I'm not playing a character. They want me to put my name on it. Yeah. I'm like, I can't do that because then people are going to. I've done that with acting where um, I played a gang member once and, and get hard. And then I was like, I don't want to play any more gang members yeah. because I'm not a gang member. I'm not any t- I'm, I remember going in on the first day to wardrobe and talking with the lady for two minutes and she just goes no offense but I just don't understand I don't see you as a gang member no I know I didn't either yeah yeah but I, did, I just didn't smile and I kept it I believed it thank you but yeah uh, it was hard for me to be like Ron's not Ron ain't got that grit yeah <laughs> And but to me, I was like, okay, I'm I'm not showcasing the best parts of myself for this, and this isn't. That's definitely not a road I want to continue to go down to be tougher and tougher and tougher. Then that's not me. Uh, and so I was like, I don't want to play a gang member anymore. But you often, I still get those coming out for you because you're just like, oh, you're black and you're not tiny. Even if you were tiny, that meant you're black. So why don't you play a gang member? There is a lot of tiny gang members now. That yeah, it's that. fun. That is fun. Yeah, because they're tougher. <laughs> they're like, oh, I got nothing to lose. There is a video. It's one of my favorite rap videos. It's from the Ninth Ward. And the real ass hardcore gangsters rapping in the Ninth Ward in New York. It's awesome. But there's all this one large black lady that's in the group of thugs, and she's the scariest one because every time, like, I don't know what she had to do to get respect yeah. from. Oh, all it's those like dudes. when you see a white guy. Yes. Yeah. They're like, oh, he he did some shit. I don't know what he did, but it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's right at home. <laughs> yes. That's the scariest person right there. Yeah. But the point was, I was trying to make was that I was just was like, I don't like what that represents. I don't like how it makes my soul feel. Mm-hmm. And that's more important to me than money. And something I noticed recently from Crazy Rich Asians, which I, w- I want to have somebody from that movie on, is because I was like, whoa, that's such a great representation and to me it showed me how powerful Asians are in America that when it's like uh, when you're like like, let's make a movie together it's like we're rich make sure rich is in the title yeah you know you you if you had an all black movie and it was all about crazy rich black people people like i don't know i don't know if i buy it how'd they get rich that's are they rappers yeah that's what people would and say. to yeah. me that's the that's representation and that's something i didn't think about much until lately where i was like i don't want to be a gang member i don't want to be oftentimes the only times I've ever really shut down jokes that I didn't want to say is when they're doing like the little stereotypes of trying to make you sound s- stupid or something. Where like, yeah, I don't know what that word means or oh, whatever. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm not going to say that because I know what that word means. And, and I'm not going to play the stereotype of someone who doesn't know me and goes like, oh, that's lit. That's what black people are like. It's also a lazy joke. Yeah. That's the. Yeah. So it's, it's an old stereotype, weird ass joke of being like, whoa, blah, 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 a lobotomy. What type of drink is that? Like, come on, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a drink at uh, the Looney Bins in throughout the Midwest. <laughs> I'm not making that up. I was like, that is an actual drink. It's a bucket. It's a giant, not a giant bucket, but it's like a plastic bucket. Mm hmm. That is, uh, it's more liquors than a Long Island iced tea. And if you can imagine, performing at the Looney Bins is, is not that much fun. But I will be in Wichita at the Looney Bin on a Tuesday. One night only, just because I like that one. It's nice, but don't, <laughs> don't drink the lobotomy on a Tuesday, you guys. Just come out and see me. It's the end of October. How awesome are we at time-wise? Ooh, we're overtime. Nice, because you're so fun to talk to. You are too, Ron Funches. Aww. We've had a nice rapport for about 10 years. We so. have. It's always been sweet and gentle. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about acting class, because we both have the same acting coach now. How's that been going for you? I I mean, I thank you every time I see you for... Ron gave me that ni- that gentle nudge several times. Like, you should take some classes. And well, you're such a unique personality. I mean, part of it is your voice, of course. And um, but I, w- when I see myself on television, and and again, these aren't always things I'm like, oh, I'm loving, I'm doing it. But I go, oh, this is easy money, mm-hmm. and it's about just hitting your lines and doing things. And I'm like, there's no way that you can't do that. Like, well, it was huge for me when you uh, hooked me up to come see you tape Undateables. Because there is that fear of like the big apparatus and like, can you, and then I watched 
yeah, you're just hitting marks and hit lines. And I was like, oh, I can do that. And it was like, you were very motivating, not in that your success, but how you handled it. Cause that's what I think I get fearful of the most about success is fucking it up, mm-hmm. not getting it. Like, I think a lot of people just don't want to be successful because there's responsibility. I don't mind that. Uh, the responsibility of, I actually, the more things I have to do when I wake up, the better for me. Uh, because the devil's no, uh, oh, I get it. Yeah, idle, you know, idle hands. This is the devil's devil. playground, yes, baby. With, you got an yeah. imagination like me and him. Yeah, you don't. We don't need because uh, we'll poke at stuff too. But it was that, and then when I the first time I talked to Myra, the couple things she said, I was like, oh, like she communicates to us. I think to stand ups really well, mm-hmm. and that's when I was like, and then once I realized what it really is. I realized like, oh, I've kind of been doing this on stage for a long time. And then. Do you find that it helps your stage performance? Oh, with that, I mean, this new thing I'm working on, just from these classes, the last month of classes, there's three transitions I know how to do now that make it from being funny to being like, oh, shit. Yeah, that was one of the things I learned from acting class right away was like, oh, there's so much more value that I'm not using in my face or my body and selling a joke. And, and now sometimes I can do a joke and I can hit the punchline and then I just move my eyes a certain way and it gets a whole bigger roar of laughter. Yes. And it's just like, oh, and that's all because I'm more aware of my body and I'm, I'm acting. You know? Well, and just presenting your body in a certain way for a joke can open. Yes. Yeah, I watch, and now I watch television and movies a lot. You see people too, and you're like, like you wouldn't notice before mm-hmm. until you start really studying it and stuff, and you're like, oh, that motherfucker's good at acting. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know who he is, but he is good yeah, at acting. Yeah, natural. Yeah. <laughs> or like sometimes, like certain, there's like the, like an annoying female character. Sometimes you're like, I don't like that. Oh, she's good, because mm-hmm. I don't like her. That's good. Yeah. You're like, Oh, I see how this is. <laughs> You're getting worked like wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, it was like Nanette. People that didn't like Nanette. I was like, she worked you guys. If you really didn't like it, that's what she wanted you. She didn't want you to like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I watched, I didn't watch all of it. Um, so I'm too. not a fool. You need to. I, I will. I like watching things. Um, but also, I'm always like when everybody is like, you should check it out. Is no quicker way for me to not watch something. I was, because Aparna stays with us when mm-hmm. she's in L.A. sometimes. So she was real hip to it. Mm-hmm. So I got, before any of the backlash, I just kind of watched it one night. And I was like, I didn't see that, foresee the, all that crazy talk and all that coming from them. I just thought, oh, that's neat what she did. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, because that's when people get jealous when they're like, oh, I thought I had to go set up punch, set up punch, set up punch, set up punch, call back. And that's how I got a cool ass special. And she was just like, I just did what I wanted to do. I communicated who I was in my way. Yes. And that to me, that's my favorite art Mm -hmm. is anybody that's like, oh, this is cool. This is real. Because this is and like when you see young people. The young comics. Mm-hmm. I was in Atlanta recently, and there was this, I forget her name, but she was different. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. And that's also one of the things that pushes me um, to keep going forward, where I'm like, oh, I want to write my own shows and do my own things, because I'm like, oh, like these festivals and things like that, like, I had my time with those. Yeah. Like, those are fun, and you get to go drink and eat pizza at a time where I needed to have free pizza. I don't Mm -hmm. need free pizza anymore. And so I should go out and do my things and let this new crop of comedians take those spots that I shouldn't, that I don't need. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I quit doing stand up. It just means like, do I need to be at every freaking festival or do everything? It's like, no, I need to go. I need to have a balance because part of me also wants to get my art out in a show that I'm writing or, or acting. I like all these things. These are fun. Well, and there's, that's, that's it. Cause I was so for a long time, what I would, if you weren't super focused on stand up, you weren't in my 
radar Mm -hmm. because I was so, and I still, I mean, that is my first love is stand up. It's to me, there's nothing better, but I do like acting. I've done a little bit. I mean, I've done a little bit of it and the way I did it is not the way it's conventional. I've played the opposite Sasha Baron Cohen and that's not what I've learned is not many people do things the way he does them. Uh, (laughs) But I got cut out all that stuff, which was also a really fun thing to learn and watch because you get these expectations. You're Mm -hmm. like, I might be in. And then you realize like, there's no reason for me to be, this was about the thing we were Mm -hmm. doing at the time. And which was still, I learned and got that confidence and it, to come full circle about the Sasha thing. I haven't told many people. This was like during like one of my darkest, I was living underneath, a friend's stairs in like a studio apartment in a studio basement. Seth Lazier, remember mm-hmm. him? He's oh yeah, I'm familiar s- with this. I'm familiar with this environment. Oh yes, okay, yeah. You and uh, just darkness because a lot of untrue stuff was being spread, and then I wasn't the best human being at the time, and I was trying to get out of it, and I was realizing how to behave and become who I needed to be, and. It was around the time where DVDs were happening, you know, where you just go get DVDs and you play, and they had all the extra features. Mm-hmm. And, um, I watched, I just wore out Bruno. I bought it for like $4, and it had all the behind the scenes, and I watched everything I could about it, because I was like, this is, what he's doing is amazing. I was like, if no one else is doing anything like this, and the way he's making people be who they are mm-hmm. was beautiful to me. I agree with that. I watched Borat recently, and I was like, this still holds up surprisingly well. And Bruno I like more than Borat because he deals with sexuality more. Mm -hmm. And I think that fascinates me because of how weird it makes people and mean it makes people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. More than anything else, more than race or anything. It's like the sexuality thing is a real problem for people. Uh, So that's the why I like. And he played with celebrity a lot, which in our culture is fascinating. But then, and to be really down, but be like, this guy's really amazing, and I, I want to learn as much. And then fast forward, like, what, five or six years, I get a call, and I'm like, do you want to work with this? And you're like, what is happening? Yeah. So it's, it's like, an that's, experience. that's that thing of, like, you just keep moving forward. And I think that's, if you keep moving forward, that's, that's momentum, that's life. You keep getting better. Sure, things piss you off, but mm-hmm. that's and usually what I mean. I went to the hot. I'm doing hot yoga right now. I'm doing whole thirty and hot <laughs> yoga for thirty days because uh, I need that little bit every. I've realized I need something every month, or I'll just wake up and start smoking weed. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Need, oh no, I gotta have a focus, or I am a mess. You don't want to <laughs> leave me to my invite the devices. I'm like looking up every porn. And uh, I so can steal jack off like six times a day if I'm bored. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Easy. yeah. <laughs> easy. I thought it would go away, but it doesn't. No. Easy. I got to have a focus. And that's what I was talking about before where I'm like, oh, I can't. I, I really hope that they pick up the show because it's just like, I got to have a drive. I can't be like just a guy with a job. Yeah. I, no matter what the job is. It doesn't matter if it's working on a roof or working at a bank or working on a TV show. If it's not something I'm passionate about, my life gets weird. It's so well, I think you're like me too. Like I have no problem throwing the deuces if I don't like what's happening. Mm-hmm. If like if I feel strongly enough, like I've walked out of so many jobs where they're like, "Where are you going?" I'm just been like, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm not coming back. <laughs> I, I can count six right now on my uh, just the top of my head that I where I've been like, "This is bullshit." Well, like what you're talking about about moving forward cause to me I think that where you're talking about where you get these goals and a lot of times they're things that you didn't even know this experience was going to happen for you but it means so much to you because and it clearly it was meant to be and, and, and sometimes that's just what, what you have to be about is moving forward and not because a lot of the goals you set don't even happen the way you want them no you know? most like, don't they yeah. just happen the way they need to happen and that's what i've been trying to do and i'm like okay they didn't pick up that show let that go something else is coming along or if not whatever i meant to be doing it at the time it is what i'm doing the universe is always taking care of me in that regard so i should just relax and have fun um but difficult sometimes oh like because i think 
<laughs> yeah. I think you and I have very similar personalities in that we are very laid back unless it's something we're passionate about. But if we choose to do something, I want to be the best I can and the most informed as possible. If yeah. I'm going to put my time and effort into it, that's what Aaron makes fun of me. She's like, she's like, I was like, oh, I, I'm like pretty good at this thing. And she was like, yeah, you tried. That's what <laughs> she's like. That's your thing. If you decide you're going to do it. And I was like, oh, that is true. But I have to decide. Yeah. That's been a lot of things with my health or whatever. I have to, because I knew when I was backsliding and I was like, I'm eating cookies. And I tell myself like, not tomorrow. And I was like, mm, probably tomorrow because mm. you haven't decided. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to decide. And I, and I reached that point um, over the weekend where I was like, Okay, no matter what they say about the show, I'm making the show. And well, so no matter what that has to be, I have to get my body in shape. So means we're, so that means I've decided we're done. So we're going to keep treating ourselves as a leading man and, and not go out on these cookie excursions that I've been doing. And just that sounds pretty fun. Though. It does. Maybe that's the show I should have pitched. Cook, I mean, you still can cookie excursions starring Ron Funches. I actually I'm on board. And you want you in? Get, I'm in, and you can get homie involved with the cookies brand. Yeah, and burner. You, you get burner involves smoking the cookies and then we go look for cookies and we go and eat cookies guys if you if you're oh. if we need investors and we need writers uh halston you want to produce yes, sir. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great billy wayne um is there anything you want to plug is there anything else you're working on getting better that you want to talk about since we should have wrapped up a while ago i'm just trying to like i said get better at all aspects of hollywood for lack of a better term like just become a better writer and actor so I can do more things than, and then I can do more stand up is the whole goal, but also enjoy it. Just do more things I like to do and say the things I need to say the way I want to say them. That's the constant. And then being a good dad and husband is, I know I don't lead with those things, but that's just like, a, that's just that's the, the under, rock. Underneath. That's the underlying. Yeah. You are a good dad. I know that for sure. Thank you. I've watched you. Um, there's been times where we, I think, helped each other in that regard. Where I was, I always regard is probably the word I've said a lot in, this like po- that. in that podcast. Regard, but it's a good word, it's and you're, fun. you're not you're not misusing it, which I, I think know. is. <laughs> but it's, I said it a lot. Um, but <laughs> you're very good, regardless, dad, of and that. regardless of what I was saying before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're a great dad watching you. Um, have to deal with things legally a lot with your, with your ex and stuff and, and the same time that I was as well yeah. and, and me having to get sole custody of my son and, and seeing you just have to struggle to make sure that you were in your son's life uh, at times where, where it seems like she would have preferred you not to be and it was a uh, yeah I was there was some it we're past most of it but yeah there's some tough illogical things happening for a time and that makes like i said like all of it's a silver lining you know what i mean when people say well there's a silver like even trump as bad as he is he's making us all have a different discourse that we've needed to have for a long time do you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. it was like that darkness made me realize because she did keep him from me for a little bit and that's I mean, I, I laugh just because it prote- protects me because it was, the, without a doubt, the hardest thing I've ever had to do, and I don't wish it mm-hmm. upon it. Like, I really had to remove myself when the ca- babies in cages and stuff, when that was happening, because I was having trouble focusing on my daily life because of that stuff, because I'm like, people don't understand what that is. Yeah. No, I understand. I mean, I do understand just because there was the time period where the reason why I had to go get so cussy in my son where sometimes I didn't know you know no matter what I was doing in my best my best interest or, or me trying to provide mon- monetarily or what I'm doing because I wasn't there and because the, um, she would do some things to make sure that I didn't have access to him there'd be times where I didn't know if he was eating or if he was going to school or if he was being truly taken care of and it was the most frightening 
few months in my life because there, there was a time period where um, I couldn't get a hold of them for a couple of weeks. I'm calling, I'm emailing, and then I just get a random call that's just like, hey, pay, you better pay the electricity or it's getting cut off tomorrow. And it's just like, oh, first of all, is he okay? How First are you of all, doing? How are you? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, uh, and of course I pay it because I'm like, I can't not have you. You have to. Do thing, but it's also like, I didn't have that money. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that on hand. You know, I had to pull it from other sources. And, and having that fear. And my, my, my mom even talks about it where she's like, she was like, I, there were a couple of months before you got him where I, I wasn't sleeping and I was like neither was I yeah. <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> like no, do, yeah and then you're also trying to be funny yes which yeah. is like a weird thing and that's one of the things Myra really helped me with was um I, I think I was pretty new to her class at this during this time period and she she could just see through it and she's just like you have this persona like nothing bothers you and nothing's nothing phases you and your life's such a funness but i can look you i can look in your eyes and see you got a shit ton of things going on yeah and i started crying right in the middle of class she has that way I yeah mean, she does. i knew that about you the first time i saw you too <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah it, well but people who who have it people who carry it can see it well and just I think that's what makes good comedians, too, if we're being honest, is people that can look at other people and see who they are Mm -hmm. and see who they truly are Mm -hmm. without their bullshit. You know, like, I think Doug Stanhope's one of the greatest comedians of all time, and the honesty that man has about himself and other people is what it is. There's a fearlessness. And I tell young kids, they're like, I want to be like Doug Stanhope. Like, first of all, your parents probably loved you in a way that he has never did, so you can never be him. And you can't live in Bisbee, so mm-hmm. don't be. Just be who you are. Absolutely. That's like Ric Flair. I bring everything back to wrestling. I think when Ric Flair was coming up, he wanted to be like Dusty Rhodes. And it's yeah, just he can't like, be Dusty Rhodes. You can't Ro- be Dusty Rhodes. No. You got to be Ric Flair, man. Yeah. Be Ric Flair. You're Ric Flair. Everybody loves Ric Flair. That's And that's the problem can I say this to all you young comics that want to get famous? You don't even know who you are and you're going to get famous and then you have to be that guy or that girl the rest of your life. That makes you're not even good at it yet. Just chase getting good. Then Mm -hmm. chase getting famous. That's one of the things that I, it wasn't a a conscious thing or a fame based thing, but I got some feedback when I was losing weight where people were like, well now people don't know who you are and they're not gonna like well it's not about that and also i started seeing um shows where it pop up where they would just get other fat black guys with dread fun dreads and they were doing my shtick and i was like oh i go that's fine yeah you can have that because i'm not even done growing into who i am yet i'm going to be i'm i don't even know what this is yet that was me not knowing anything you were open micing yeah yeah and now i'm learning i'm putting it together i'm putting things together where i'm like okay it's not just about being adorable also i'm a sexy grown man and i will do grown man things he'll fuck you yes <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to exit uh billy wayne davis you got any plugs where can people see you where should they follow you uh at billy wayne davis on just if you google billy wayne davis all that social stuff will come out and you can pick the one you like to follow um i will be in portland october 7th at the siren theater it's a sunday and then seattle the 4th which is a thursday uh of october those are the two on i really want to push just because i know you have a good northwest (laughs) fan base so portland come out like that portland if i had to move back to the northwest i would move to you know what no i'd move to fucking eugene i like eugene's great it is really great great. i'll be there that saturday that friday fun sandwich shops they they do and then the weed's really good because it's like it's better than portland because they grow it around Mm -hmm. eugene yeah yeah, mm-hmm. and the guys are, the women are pretty cute, and the guys are no competition. None at all, because they'll just lay down in the street. Yeah, it is it's like, like okay, um, 
I don't play hacky sack. Boom. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he's got five women on him. Right now. <laughs> it is a crazy town of like world class athletes. Or just junkies. Mm-hmm. And then there's just like fun people in between. But those two, it is. It's I like Eugene played. a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could just say, please go see Billy Wayne Davis. He's one of my favorite comedians. He's Thank great. You. He's hilarious. Um, he opens me on occasion. I don't even like do it too much because he's too good at comedy. To, uh, he's a headliner. And he can't afford and, me. Yeah, I can't afford him. Uh, he, he costs more than my other features. <laughs> <laughs> When you did ask me that, I was like, I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're worth it. It was fun, too. Yeah. I mean, because we don't get to credits, hang out anymore. Doing, yeah, we don't. all busy. Yeah. But go see him. Um, I just recommend him. He's a truly unique voice. Um, a smart, smart comedy. Um, and I, I am one of my favorites and a good guy. So thanks for Thank coming. Thank you, Ron. This is a good. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I got. This is a good. Can we smoke? dabs you know? yeah all right i don't have one in my house because come on <laughs> bye bye <laughs>